Hi, uh, Stephanie Bonner. I just had a quick question about um, the comprehensive health program curriculum. Um, I appreciate what you said. Um, I did actually look just at the information that was available to you. Are you going to make available once the curriculum is created? Because my concern more is like my son will be in second next year. And second's a little different than like fifth, <coughs> middle, and high school, just in the way that the scheduling is done throughout a day. Um, and I'm curious specifically how that curriculum will be implemented amongst the lower elementary levels. So when will we have access to that? Mr. Bombardier? Can you hear me? Yeah. <laughs> okay. So as the, once the curriculum guides are updated and revised and aligned to the new standards, which are the 2020 standards, those curriculum guides are placed on the agenda. The agenda is um, for board approval, and at that point there'd be opportunity as well um, for um, any comment, but they will be board approved and placed on an agenda, uh, or they will be placed on an agenda for board approval prior to being implemented. And this is for implementation in September of 2022. Right. So I, as a person, or, uh, I can see, as a parent, I will be able to see what person was created prior to the board meeting. No. Of approval. So as soon as it gets approved by the board, then it goes public. Yes, it'll be updated and replaced um, where it is on the website once that new curriculum is board approved. So following that board approval, the website is then updated and the portal is updated. Okay, and if you have public comments that happen in that same night, is there a chance for changing approval and that kind of stuff? I mean, what's the point of public? It seems like you guys are only the decision makers in that aspect, right? <laughs> The, the, it would sort of be putting the cart before the horse. So the, the, the board has to vote on it. If okay. It gets approved and then it, it goes to the public. However, yes, you'll have an opportunity to comment that night. Okay. Yes, absolutely. Okay. Yep. And, and when you say the opt out, that totally makes sense in the higher grades. But again, in second grade, I don't know how. With other school districts, had explained it is like, say, a book would be read during. ELA in second grade, how do you... So one of, the, one of the things we're working through right now are the logistics of that, right? So in yeah. theory, you'd have to be informed as to where, what on that, where on that curriculum you may or may not want to have your child participate. And then we, we have an obligation then to notify you of when it's going to be taught. And then what happens in place of that? Your child. Yeah, we're, that's what we're working on right oh. now to get that all squared away. So once we go public with it, it's a complete document. So it's not, you know, hodgepodge or anything like that. Okay. So you'll have everything. And it's got to be broad because that's what I find when I do. And I went through all the curriculum this year and last year and went through each line item. It's very broad. But my concern is my child is really young and I just don't think he's mature enough or has the mental capacity to understand complex things. He doesn't even understand how his grandma's his grandma or things like that. So I just want to make sure that I'm prepared as a parent beforehand so I can better help them. And if I feel that it's appropriate, then sure. If I feel like it's just something getting thrown in there and they're like, what? Um, I'd rather be prepared as a parent. Absolutely. So I'm hoping that that is what the plan is. Um, so I can make an informed decision and be able to help add or explain better. So. Okay, Thank that's you. it. Thank you. Only because it's on the same topic. Uh, Cindy Santora, uh, my daughter goes to Lloyd Road. Um, I want to let you know that um, the principal of Lloyd Road, I'm terrible with names, please don't have to say them, and the um, health teacher uh, did get back to me about my concerns, and I'm going to tell you that it was awesome. Um, she even sent me her PowerPoint, which was amazing. Um, it was very transparent, which I loved, and my daughter was actually able to attend health um, this year because, in my mind, the lesson was absolutely age-appropriate. Um, I just have a quick question on this, only because now I'm suspicious about anything with the word curriculum. So it says, Curriculum for Lloyd Road. So what partners um, to collaborate and plan curriculum units and assessments, share ideas, strategies, and resources? I'm just wondering, what is Thought Partners? What, what page are you on? 
uh, page two or five on personnel agenda. So thought, thought partners are teachers um, that are across different buildings. So at the K-3 level particularly, when we have teachers at, that teach the same grade but at three different locations, we want to ensure regular articulation. To make so make sure they, they're all doing the same thing, right? Yeah, so okay, we bring them sure. together. We call them thought partners because they share ideas and thoughts and strategies and also promotes consistency and also supports transitions because of the three different Yeah, yeah, I get it. I just wanted to make sure. Thank you. Abby Berg. Um, I live in Sutton Point. I used to live in the D section. So today was a hard night for me to come in because I didn't know if I should write things down or kind of go off the top of my head because my last month here in this district has been awful. And I've had a couple of bad years here. Um, and this last month has saddened me that I have been literally breaking my bank to stay in this town because I grew up here and I want to stay here. I want to raise my kids here so that they can have experiences that I didn't have but going to private school. And I've lost that almost will to stay here. Um, and I'm sure most of the people on the board don't know what I'm even talking about because it appears that the left hand is not even talking to the right hand. My main issue, and I have two huge issues, but my main issue is with your COVID policy. My middle school child, who's still in the school, and my Lloyd Road child have not been in school for, not since last Thursday, the Thursday before. This is the second time this month that they've been pulled, and the third time I've been asked to COVID test my children. The first time my COVID, I chose to COVID test my daughter and my sons because my daughter wasn't feeling well. So I thought it would be responsible for me to pull my kids out of school, get her COVID tested right after Thanksgiving, and make sure that they're all safe because I didn't want to have them spreading anything. You know, and if we had had strep tests that we could see years ago, I would have done the same thing, okay? So I didn't have a problem with that. That was my choice. That was on a Tuesday they got COVID tested. They went back to school on Wednesday. The next Thursday, I get a phone call from the nurse at MAMP saying that my son in eighth grade has this horrible fever and I have to pull all the kids out again. And I was surprised because I would never send my kids into school with a fever. I'm really lucky that I work from home, so I have a lot more flexibility than some parents. Like if my kids are coughing too much, I'm going to keep them home even before all of this was going on because I'm really lucky that I have that ability to like move around a little bit more freely than some other parents, right? In the 30 minutes that I took my son, picked up my daughter from here, and took all three of my kids to the doctor's office, where I had to pretty much beg and cry in pediatrics to please go test these kids, because CVS, everything was four or five days out, and I wanted to get them back into school. I already knew Thursday wasn't going to be a wash, obviously. Friday was probably a wash. I wanted to get back them back on Monday. In that 45 minutes, that um, horrible fever that she said he had magically disappeared. Because when I got over to the PM Pediatrics, the kids didn't have fevers. No problem. They were out Thursday. They were out Friday. They went back to school on Monday. The following Thursday, I get another phone call from the nurse. Your son threw up, and he's coughing a lot. Those are symptoms. You've got to pull your kids out again. Now, mind you, the week before, my daughter and my sons had all been COVID tested on Tuesday with negative results, so they went back to school on Wednesday, and I had to retest all of them again, right, on Thursday. So that's two COVID tests in one week, and then the following week, I got to go take test these kids again. Well, what they told me was, because my oldest has COVID symptoms, my middle, my youngest, who's here in this school, she doesn't need to get tested, only he has to get tested, and when he tests negative, she can come back to school. But because I tested him so much, I put his health insurance card somewhere. I don't remember where I put it. So now I can't get a test, right? I'm not going to go to the hospital because that's not what you're supposed to do. So now my kids are pulled, and they're still not back in school yet, okay? And no one has symptoms. No one's really sick. What I found out was he didn't really throw up. He had a quiz in the afternoon they didn't study for. And because he's smart, he knows what to say to the nurse which now the rule is, unless you're bleeding from the head with bones sticking out, do not go to the nurse. I don't care. 
Like, I don't want to deal with this anymore. And so since I couldn't get him COVID tested, I couldn't even bring my daughter back with, her, with a negative COVID test. I was told no. And she had to stay out for 14 days, and he has to stay out for 10. However, the first week of December, I find out, or the last week of November, right before Thanksgiving, that my daughter was sitting on a bus next to a little girl who was tested COVID positive. And how do I know that? Because she was talking to her on the phone and said, I haven't seen you in a few days. Where are you? She's like, oh, I have COVID. And I didn't get not even one phone call from the school to let me know that my child might have or might not have been exposed. And she wasn't sitting across the bus. They were sitting in either a three-seater or a two-seater right next to each other. And were they wearing masks? Were they not wearing masks? Who knows? But not a phone call. Got to take my kids out of school. And you know what? No way. I'm not doing it. Tuesday, Thursday came, Friday came, and by Monday, I called the school up and I was like, are we going to educate the kids? Are they just going to sit in my house and stare at me, you know? Oh yeah, we can put them on virtual. So now that opens up an entirely whole new issue that I have. So now my kids are home. Friday, the CDC changes its rules, right? Ten days, which means in theory my kids could have come back to school today, but I was informed today in a conversation I had with Dr. Micah that we're going to implement those after the break. Now I get it's only three and a half days left here, but for my daughter who's in fourth grade, this is the most fun week probably out of the year. They get to get dressed in comfy clothes, they get to do lots of fun activities, it's the holiday. She doesn't get to do any of that. She also missed the winter dance and the camp out night. She didn't miss two devil's games or a birthday party because obviously it's okay that she does that. But she can't go to school, right? And then I start thinking, that, oh, then the best was I get a letter today saying that my kids have missed so much school that if it, school deems necessary, they're going to call if they feel it's necessary. And I know for a fact that the school district has done that because I have a friend who's gotten a ticket in the mail. But they can call DCPMP, which is formerly DIFAS, and the truancy officers for all the days that they're missing. Well, they're missing school because you guys keep on pulling them out of school. Minus the one or two days that I decided to be you know, responsible when I wasn't sure what was wrong with them. And then I think about my middle child who was having lots of struggles in this school district. And starting in October, I told the middle school, we're gonna have a problem, and if we don't get a handle on this, seriously get a handle on this, this kid's gonna get kicked out by December, I guarantee before winter break. He's gonna be failing all his classes and his behavior's gonna kick him out. Ms. So what happened? Ms. Berg, I'm sorry, could we just, um if you could get to the question that you have for Okay, my question, okay, here's my question. I want to know why, first of all, if you have kids suspended and or on fake quarantines, because it's not, I'm calling it COVIDcation, okay? Why are we not using our virtual? Why if a kid is suspended, why are we not giving him an education? We spent $100,000 on that, okay? And also, I want to know when the Board of Education is going to stand up like they did in Middletown and say enough is enough, and we're not going to do this to these kids anymore. Because while you guys are sitting here sending parents letters about how you're going to call DIFAS and you're going to call all these truancy officers and threatening the parents, you know, I could throw it back and say, you guys are the ones who are abusing and neglecting our kids. And I'm trying, I've been to every meeting, I'm trying to be kind, I'm trying to keep an open mind. But my kid is suspended 100,000 times this year and he didn't get any education. Today was the first day since the beginning of the month of the month that he ever got any education. And why are we not using the resources that we paid for? That are everyone in this town paid for. Why are we not using them? Ms. Burke. And why are we making our own rules? Because I did call the county superintendent's office and I called the state and the rules that you guys are implementing are not the rules that are necessarily the rules. Well that's that's not that's true. Not um, so um, I don't know why you got letters home. I will address that first thing in the morning. Um, I, I, it, I'm perplexed by that myself. Um, I, was told, I was told, I called. I understand. The I, they told me that it's, a, it's a, just I, a general. I, Come on. And I, I'm gonna find out about that in the morning. And um, for remote instruction, um, it's clear by, from the state, from the DOE, that we can't give, offer remote instruction for suspensions. I, I, 
Wait, yeah. so is the question for suspensions or for quarantining or if your In child general, is if a kid is quarantined, immediately they should be set up. You shouldn't have to call the school That's, and babysit, yeah. yes. okay? You should not. And, yes. And I'm going And I'm not the only one. I'm sure I'm not the only one. I'm just the loudest. That's that, that's why I mentioned earlier if we could if you have questions go directly to the building principal because if your child is sent home for COVID concerns then yes we agree that they should be set up with virtual immediately we shouldn't but have not to be um, suspension is something totally different. so what is what is the school planning on doing if you have a child who is consistently getting suspended or having behavioral issues where how are we how is the district planning on educating them and not making it the parents because last I checked I don't get a pension and I'm not a teacher. For suspended? Just in general, if you have a kid who's getting suspended, okay. right? Constantly I and it's happening maybe a lot. Can, do you want to follow up? Yeah, after I, I will. We'll follow up with you tomorrow on that. No, not on me. My kid's starting to get it. You guys approved it today. Thank you. He got his first day of education today in the last month. Thank you. I tried. I tried. Believe me, but I don't know how to do the math. I looked. I tried. I didn't get any communication from the teachers and it wasn't even until we, I called we I talked to the ESS lady that we the guidance counselor had called. It's not only happening to me. That's my concern. It's not about me. It's not about my kid. The concern is what else are you guys doing for parents who don't know? That's, that's why I'm trying to make it known. If you have a concern, to reach out to your building principal. Because if your child is sent home, they should have the virtual if they're sent home for that reason. And what about if the child is having issues and they're getting suspended? Why do we have that's to... That's separate and we can separately talk to suspension. Well, I don't I mean... It's, it's a different it's, issue. Suspension right, but is different what is, from... So it's not a private conversation. That's a public conversation. What I get it, but we're... Gonna do? I can triple nothing. past the three minutes at this point. Again, nothing. Thank you. Thank you for confirming that you're doing nothing. I'm so disappointed. So disappointed. on the sex ed stuff, um, I do have older girls, and um, I think that my oldest daughter, you know, she learned it at the right time. I am totally, I really don't want um, my uh, first grader learning the sex ed stuff. I think it's more appropriate for like maybe eighth, ninth grade, and a lot of what I'm seeing is age inappropriate, and there's a lot of books in the libraries and stuff that are totally age inappropriate. So you can just totally opt out of the sex ed in elementary school? There will be opt-out provisions in, in the policy itself, yes. Okay, so just email you and say we're opting out and that's it. I just want to make sure, I just, it's not, for me, I read a lot of it and it's not age appropriate. Uh, understood, and that's why there'll be opt-out provisions. So okay. like we spoke about before, we're working on getting all of that opt-out procedures in place so when it all becomes part of the curriculum we'll be able to address that yes okay i do want to thank you for trying to you know keep the schools open um with the, you know the COVID stuff and doing your best on that so we do appreciate that you know all right thank you hi i'm diana pell in aberdeen um i just wanted to make a real you know, as we're getting into this year and things are starting to raise up and, and we're starting to have more cases. Um, and just, you know, another impassioned plea, it's, you guys have said too, please keep the schools open. And please do what you can to keep the students and staff in the schools. Uh, I, I'm wondering about whether there were any changes in the safe return to school policy that was, you know, is going to be submitted um, because I, I don't know if, if anything with the quarantines or anything along those lines has changed. Um, I guess I'm wondering about that. So I could, the safe return plan um, basically states that we will continue to follow the Department of Health and um, all of the guidance received. Um, and that is basically the extent of, um, in terms of what we are following. So the safe return plan talks about the protocols that we have in place uh, for maintaining um, safe, clean right. environment, sanitizing, and then we will follow and continue to follow all of the guidelines set forth by the DOH and the department. Oh, right, and that was what was on the one that's posted on the website from Correct. July. And so I was just wondering if there are any changes. The only changes um, was the crisis go, which we no longer have in place, which is the um, screening tool. Um, that was the major change. Okay, all right, good to know. And then um, aside from that, I just wanted to also um, encourage, this is more uh, at the, the building level, um, but 
uh, maintaining in-school education and extracurriculars to promote academic and social development of all learners. Um, you know, it, it, I, I was happy to hear about Lloyd's Camp Read a Lot, 200 plus students and staff in the gym, December 1st. I was happy to hear about the winter chill at Lloyd. Uh, it was interesting that uh, uh, just, what, two weeks, not even two weeks ago, that the Harlem Wizards played the Cliffwood teachers in the MAMS gym. If you were there, that was a, a crowded place. Um, and so it's just very frustrating when you got things like the, uh, the sixth grade band and chorus, which is not a huge number of kids, um, that their, uh, their performance, uh, the uh, audience was removed from it. It's just frustrating. So I'm, I'm just as frustrated, but to your point about keeping schools open, so on Friday we had over 100 staff absent. Um, we are about two teachers away at the middle school from quarantining us to close, so I made the decision to, to push it out through YouTube so we could keep the school open. We have no intention of canceling extracurricular activities. Everything will be looked at on a case-by-case -case basis. So the, the number of quarantines at Lloyd at the time were not to the extent the middle school was at, so that was the decision that was made. But let me be perfectly clear, we're not sitting up here looking to cancel extracurricular activities. We've spent the last two years trying to keep schools open, and that is our most important thing. So the decision was made in order to keep the middle school open, that's the, that's the position that we took. Well, I mean, it's clear you're not canceling extracurricular activities at the middle school even because sports are still happening with people in the audience. And so it just, it sends, well, I, I, Understood. It sends a really frustrating um, message to performing arts parents. And I know that we're a small and loud crowd, but this is the time that yet once again, this specific circumstances, like a sixth grade uh, band and chorus concert and a seventh grade band and chorus concert, three days before break with two teachers involved needs to stop. But we can still have basketball, we can still have wrestling, we can still have all that stuff. And it just, it stays. Thank you. Hi. Okay. So I wanted to ask a question because I have to kind of feel for Abby um, because I know that when my son was in middle school, he used to play, I have to go to the nurse because I don't feel well. And it got to a point where I like basically told the nurse, unless he's bleeding or dying, don't call me. Don't call me. If you see blood or if he's sick enough, you put him in an ambulance and you take him to a hospital. So. As kids get older, they get smarter, and they learn how to play the system. So my question is, like, how much power do these nurses have? I mean, like, literally, if my kid goes <coughs> to clear their throat, I mean, are we all like, oh my god, COVID, quick, run! And like, now the kid has to get picked up and quarantined and all that stuff. So my question is, like, is it one person making a decision? Um, is it five people making the decision? I mean, is someone going, eh, and all of a sudden now it's quarantine? Is it possible that we're over quarantining? Are we taking too many kids and putting them in quarantine? I mean, like, I have to also agree with Diana. I mean, like, you don't want to piss off the sports parents, do you? You don't want to tell Johnny that he can't have his senior football year. That's, like, the worst thing that you could do. Because then you're also talking about pay to, like, all the coaches and stuff. So I think it's really unfair that you guys would cancel a concert for sixth graders but have no issues packing a gym for a basketball game or a football game. I'm sorry, it's like, it's hypocritical. It's absolutely hypocritical. And I am very concerned with the amount of kids that are being quarantined in the middle school because at that age, simple fact, they're smarter than us at that point. They know they don't want to take that quiz, so they know if they cough, the nurse is gonna call someone up and boom, now they're home. So I think we have to be smarter than them and we have to realize that we might be getting played just a slight amount. My baby loves school. She goes to school every day. She wants to get the attendance award. Not only that, she goes to summer school. That's how much she loves school. She willingly signs up for it. When you get to the middle school, you start getting kids who maybe don't love it as much. So what I'm trying to say is, I think we need to look a little bit more into these quarantines, guys. Be a little smarter than an eighth grader. I mean, and, 
and also Understood. like yeah don't let the nurses make I mean like I want to feel for the nurses I want to feel for teachers but I think we need to be a little smarter than that okay thank, thank you. you hi I had a quick question um, sure. so the the open strategic plan that you were talking about before that I think it was July and we're just resubmitting it just removing the What's it called? The, thing the, the um, yeah, crisis, crisis bell. bell. That's mm -hmm. the only thing that changed. Hasn't the CDC changed the quarantine guidelines? The, the, so shouldn't that be different in our quarantining strategic opening plan? And how did Middletown Board of Ed approve a parent can decide whether they want to quarantine their kid or not? Are we able to do that? Because if other towns do that, because like everybody's yes. mentioning, and that's news to me, I, I don't have yes. a child in the under chorus, but it was upsetting to hear that because again, those parents have got one opportunity to see their kid. And I feel like maybe if it was not canceled, maybe it was postponed, so a parent or a caregiver can see it in person, that would have been the better route. Um, but my question is too, is I noticed, because I have children in two different schools, and my kids haven't had to be in quarantine yet, but from other students, the siblings thing, every building is doing something totally different. And every family is having a different experience, whether it's being put on virtual, or being quarantined, or a sibling doesn't have to quarantine, the back sibling can go to school, everyone is different, nothing is streamlined. Um, and I can see the frustration in that, and you guys aren't in those buildings every day. So it's important to listen to the parents and to hear that they were two teachers shy of quarantine in middle school where I have this child there is upsetting because are those COVID positive people that are out or those are just close contact quarantines that are almost shutting down our school? Shouldn't that make us take a look and go, wow, uh, abs Absolutely, we're people. looking at quarantining. And, and the new CDC guidance, also, they're starting the pilot test to stay in New Jersey when we get back from break. So uh, I, I, I'm not going to argue with you that over-quarantining is happening everywhere. And, yeah. and it needs to be controlled. And I, I do believe with the, uh, the new CDC guidance and the, 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 the starting to test the test to stay is going to have a big say in that moving forward. Okay, hold up. <laughs> I'm not into that either. That's swabbing your child every single day. In order well, to I'm just saying this is what the state is testing right now. That's I'm just putting that out there. So that's what you're saying that there's But a, a test to stay would avoid quarantine. But, um, I'm sorry, is that what you were referring to after break? Is there going to be piloting that? The, we, the state is asking, is the DOE is approaching various districts in the state to start piloting that once we get back from break. Or is Matter one of them? We haven't been, nobody's reached out to us. I, I call the DOE on a weekly basis and I can't tell you the last time someone called me back. <coughs> okay. So. Can, can All I right, so do we uh, expect that the quarantine guidelines are going to change once break comes? Once no, we get there, back there, from break? There's been new, as everyone has stated, there were CDC promulgated new new guidance like they do every X amount of weeks, yes. Okay. So we'll be looking to incorporate that so when I send my letter out on Wednesday or Thursday, it'll all be included in that. Okay, but again, each building, each school nurse, and every situation is different. So it's very difficult to, to, to find out, since I haven't experienced it yet, what to expect. I don't know what I'm gonna be able to expect because everyone's experience is different, which shouldn't be. It should uh, understood, be and, I, and I agree, and, I, and I'm writing all of this down, and I'm okay. going to address those inconsistencies, yes. Okay. just want to make sure that yes. I understand. So I, I think part of what was said, there was a question, our reopening plan that we had just approved, it's six months since it was originally started in July, right? Yeah. So it's not that we're just doing it for the first time, it's just a reapproval. Is that right? State mandated, yes. And the um, CDC guidelines as they change does not necessitate a new approval every time the guidelines change. That's correct, yes. So that's why we don't change our reopening plan every month or every correct. week or every other day, depending on how CDC changes, right? Yes. Correct. And the the sorry. I, Guess I'm switching the, light work here. Um, the test 
it, what the CDC is proposing, or what the state of New Jersey is proposing, is a test to stay in. So if somebody suspects my child of having COVID, I can get them tested, they can test negative, and they can stay in so they don't have to quarantine. That's what's being proposed. That's correct. It is not a come into school with a negative right. test. Right. I wanted to make sure that was clear because I thought you were thinking something else. <laughs> It's PCR. Yep. Hi, Casey Barilka. Uh, I work here at Lloyd Road. Um, I'm empathetic to everybody's situation, so I just have a couple of questions for the board. I know we hear a lot about the CDC and the Department of Health, but um, according to the Department of Education and the governor's office, we still follow the Department of Health guidance not the CDC guidance. So the CDC puts forth its recommendations, our Department of Health looks at that and then makes its own recommendations. Is that correct? Yes. yes. Okay. So then, and this is just in terms of if, and I did see what Middletown did. My concern with what Middletown did is does that create a legal exposure to the Board of Ed if they were to not follow the Department of Health guidance and someone were to become sick or severely ill by not following that guidance. <laughs> Sorry to put you on the spot. That's okay, I do this for a living. <laughs> uh, I'm gonna give the same answer I gave, I think a few board member, few board meetings ago when similar issues were raised. Um, you know, far be it for me to predict what some judge a year from now is going to say. And what I will say as a general rule is that in, in my representation of school districts over 45 years, it's not a matter of whether my clients are going to get sued. They are going to get sued. It's a matter of which lawsuit I'd rather defend. Uh, and if I'm asked rather whether I would rather defend a lawsuit representing a district who flagrantly dis disregarded state mandates and somebody got sick versus a district who followed state mandates and somebody got sick, I'd rather be representing a district that at least followed the state guidelines to at least give my client some good faith protection that they were following at least what legal guidance was out there. Um, that's the best answer that I can give you without making something up. Sure. Okay. I appreciate that. Thank you. So while I understand the legal, legal ramifications of that, like when are we going to decide like, all right, we've had enough and we need to do what we know is right and what we think is right instead of just sitting here telling, having people tell us what to do when we know what we should be doing. If I was a lawyer, I personally wouldn't couldn't wait to get to defend this case because you are in this community. You know what's going on. You shouldn't be taking orders from somebody <laughs> who shouldn't even be in office to begin with. So when are we going, now we're two years, like when is enough? When is enough? And it, I walk out every single day of my life risking getting hit by a car, getting into a car accident. I mean, isn't that the same? Is that the same? So it's like, the lady that sued McDonald's because the coffee was too hot and she got burned. It, it, it's, you guys get sued for a lot of other stuff. The fact that you want to give kids education, keep it open, have kids in school, I think is a pretty... That is our goal, is right. to keep the schools open. But you also have to say, like, we're too... But there's a, there's a certain point where the health department could shut you down. Um, but if you have too many positives. unnecessarily. So the test to say would make sense because then that would make kids. So they're only going to pilot it. You can't just go, oh, hey, I want to do it. I've been told they're going to pilot it as soon as we get back from break. Yes. But that doesn't mean that you can start implementing it. I, I don't. I didn't. I, I'm just okay. telling you what the DOE told me. Okay. Yep. And in that, if you do wind up having a conversation with somebody, are you guys going to be able to? provide the testing because like Abby was saying to get an appointment for PCR sometimes could take a couple of days. I, I agree we, but we, we also are we've been doing testing here two days a week um, for people that are unvaccinated okay. um, so we already have the internal working so you would be able to take advantage of that system that's in place right now. Okay. So you wouldn't in theory need to take that responsibility on yourself. Okay. Yep. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay. Um, oh. I just have one 
more quick question. Um, since people who, you know, who have been vaccinated or haven't, they're still both, uh, both testing positive. Um, is there anything new with the natural, like the people who actually had COVID and have natural immunity? Uh, because they say that that's kind of holding up. I even have coworkers who have had COVID in the beginning and they still have antibodies. I don't know the answer to that. I, I, okay. Yep. Nothing? You haven't heard anything regarding like... I haven't heard one thing regarding that, no. Okay. Any unfinished business from the board? I just wanted to mention um, one thing about some of the activities. They had a Harlem Wizards that I attended. It was really a great event for the PTO, the school, the community. It also bridged between Cliffwood and also the middle school. So I thought it was a beautiful thing. There were police officers there. There were community members there. It wasn't just the Cliffwood family. But I do have to say, seeing those teachers play out there and hustle, was really wonderful and it brought a community together. So I thought that that was wonderful. They also had a holiday um, bash, which I thought was a really beautiful community event as well. So I know that Cliff, I'm very Cliffwood proud. I know I've said that a couple of times, but um, whether I'm on the board or off the board, I'm still gonna be very involved in the PTO and in strategic planning. And I just wanna thank that community at Cliffwood for all that they do. Thank you. Um, so I just wanted to um, give a huge shout out to the equity team at MAMS. Uh, this past week they had a presentation that was uh, moving would be an understatement. These kids who I think were eighth graders all at MAMS, there are about ten young women I believe who uh, did this presentation and started and headed a very delicate conversation that was great about why people hold some um, beliefs, why do people act certain way when you talk about others' history, why, how can we overcome that as a community. It was amazing. My understanding is that they are supposed to be doing that once a month or that's the goal. Um, so I, there were some on Facebook that they were advertising it, so these kids went door to door advertising it. Uh, I promised them after being a part of it that I would shout it out and I highly recommend everybody come the next time they have one. It, they showed a maturity that most adults don't have. Um, sorry to say, but they were amazing. Uh, it was just such a healthy conversation and I, I was really proud of them and I saw some of their um, parents later who were also very proud of them. Ms. Rayola runs that over at MAMS and it was just fabulous. Any new business, Ms. Osborne? Um, first, I just want to say thank you to Joy for your service. Um, your newsletters that you sent out to us is uh, wonderful, and your dedication to our district. Um, Joy works in our array of sunshine people, different trades, um, through the uh, vocational school district and also to Ms. Whalen in her absence for her service and dedication to the board. Um, I understand the concern and frustrations of our parents today, and of course, um, parents that are on social media um, voicing their concerns about the district, and I applaud the women who constantly come to the meetings and speak for them, because I was one of those women on that side that would speak for the community. Um, the inconsistencies don't always come because of the buildings. We cannot disclose who's vaccinated and who's not vaccinated. I've had parents ask the same question. There are some children who are vaccinated and children who are not vaccinated who are able to come back to school the next day after being tested negative and their sibling being positive because of those guidelines. I want you to also understand that we do have children. Um, I had children in four different schools at one time. I do have children in two separate schools. And we do get the calls, and we do get the scares, and we do have to quarantine our children as well. And it's not that we um, are trying to neglect anyone's children from education, but sometimes if your child is missing for a day or two without the nurse, uh, nurse's notification of your child being missing, like Ms. Berg talked about on her own accord, they don't necessarily feel that, um, or I can't say speak for them, but 
it's my feeling that maybe the child is out because of vacation. We, some parents do take their children out because of vacation, and they wouldn't necessarily think that you would need a virtual uh, lesson at that time unless you report it to the school. So we had this conversation about virtual learning uh, when the children are out, and we understand that there was a lapse in communication, so I just encourage everybody to, if your child is out on day one, or you know your child's gonna be out the next day, just ask. If the child has to be out one day because they're waiting for a PCR test, just, just contact the building principal so at least they don't even miss the next day to be on um, virtual learning. And I just want to say to everybody, have a Merry Christmas. Please be safe and take care of each other. Okay, we're going to take a roll call on all agenda items. Dr. Delaney? Yes. Ms. Friedman? Yes. Ms. Martinez? Yes. Mr. Montone? Yes. Ms. Prezwar? Yes. Ms. Osborne? Yes. Mrs. Coley? Yes. Be it resolved that a closed session be convened for the purpose of discussing privacy, personnel, and legal matters. The subject matter of these discussions will be disclosed to the public when the reason for confidentiality subsides. Although the board cannot guarantee at the length of the executive session is estimated to be a half an hour, after which the public meeting of the board shall reconvene and proceed with business. Action will not take place. Motion and a second to enter exec session. All motion. All second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Aye.